In this month's session, Don, our carburetor expert, is going to teach Tom the finer points of servicing the Carter AVS and Holly four-barrel carburetors. The great majority of all carburetor problems are caused by dirty, sticking external linkages or incorrect external adjustments. Let's find out what Don has lined up for today's program. I'm going to cover the external linkages and adjustments on the AVS first, Tech. Then we'll do the same thing on the Holly. Just in case anyone is wondering, keeping the linkage clean and properly adjusted are most important to good carburetor performance. Problems can usually be prevented or remedied by performing these operations. However, before I start this session, I'd like to call everyone's attention to one thing. Make sure that air horn or float bowl cover screws, carburetor mounting nuts, and intake manifold mounting screws are tight and correctly torqued. A small air leak can act just like carburetor trouble, and you just might save yourself a lot of work by making this little check. How about the vacuum kick unit on the four barrels? Is it the same as on the two barrel carburetors? It works the same way, Tom. It has a modulating spring also, and is just as important to good warm-up performance. But let's review it. When the vacuum kick is correctly adjusted, the vacuum diaphragm pulls the choke valve partly open to allow just enough air to keep the cold engine running during warm-up. The vacuum kick modulates the choke coil and provides better choke valve control, which greatly improves engine warm-up performance. If the choke opening is too narrow, the engine will load up and roll. If it's too wide, the mixture will be too lean and the engine will stall. The service manual is still the best place to find the vacuum kick specs. Also, how to make the adjustments. By the way, Don, I'd like to add something at this point. There's something you should be careful of if the carburetor is removed from the car. Be sure not to bang the vacuum kick unit. If the vacuum kick diaphragm bracket or link is bent, the adjustment will be affected. Something I'd like to repeat here is to check the manifold heat control valve. If it's stuck open, you can be exact on all your carburetor adjustments and still have very poor warm-up performance. In fact, the engine may run like it's cold even when fully warmed up. The fast idle cam position guarantees the right idle speed for the amount of choke opening during warm-up. When properly indexed, the idle speed drops off at the proper time during warm-up. Correct fast idle cam position is obtained by bending the fast idle cam rod. To get the correct choke opening, make sure the fast idle cam isn't sticking and adjust by bending the upper angle of the fast idle cam rod. Detailed instructions are in your service manual and must be made before adjusting fast idle speeds. Before we go any further, let me put in a word. There's one thing I want you to be sure of when setting fast idle cam position. The fast idle adjusting screw should be against the shoulder of the proper fast idle cam step. This guarantees that the fast idle cam will be indexed properly. If not set against the shoulder, the fast idle cam will move to the next step too soon as the engine warms up and the choke opens. Thanks, Tech. That's a very important point. Fast idle speed adjustment instructions are also covered in the manuals and are easy enough to follow. Just make sure when adjusting fast idle speed that the engine is fully warmed up and that the adjusting screw is resting on the second step of the fast idle cam, not the start step. The accelerator pump, pump linkage, and bowl vent are the next items on the program. The accelerator pump and bowl vent are both operated by the pump lever, but must be adjusted separately. The accelerator pump adjustment affects the bowl vent opening, so this should be done first. Okay? The first thing to notice is the accelerator pump linkage. The three holes which change the accelerator pump stroke are in the pump lever instead of the throttle lever as on the BBD two-barrel carburetors. Do they affect the pump stroke the same as on the BBD? Yes and no, Tom. The holes affect the length of the pump stroke, but opposite from the two barrels. The outer hole provides the shortest stroke, the middle the medium stroke, and the inner hole the long stroke. The middle hole should be used for normal operating conditions. In extremely hot climates, the outer hole, which gives you a short stroke, may be used. For very cold conditions, you may want to use the inner hole for a longer stroke. Before checking the accelerator pump stroke, open the choke valve enough to release the fast idle cam. The throttle valves must be fully seated in their bores, so back off the curb idle speed adjustment screw. 
You'll need a T-scale to measure the pump stroke. The accelerator pump stroke is checked by measuring from the top of the pump plunger stem to the top of the air horn. If adjustment is needed, bend the accelerator pump rod just below the pump lever. Now you're all set to adjust the bowl vent. Does adjusting the accelerator pump affect the bowl vent opening the same as on the two-barrel job? Yes, Tom. Remember that the vent opening must always be adjusted after the pump stroke. The accelerator pump rod must be in the middle hole for proper adjustment of pump stroke. If you're changing the pump stroke for extreme conditions, don't adjust the bowl vent until after you relocate the pump rod in the inner or outer hole. Incorrect adjustment of the bowl vent can cause performance problems at idle and off idle conditions. If the vent does not open when the throttle is closed, it could contribute to rough idle, stalling, or hot start problems. If the vent does not close as the throttles are cracked, the off idle mixture will be too rich. The right place and way to check the bowl vent opening is to insert the specified drill or gauge between the vent and air horn at the end of the bowl vent lever where the opening is greatest. To reset the vent opening, bend the short tang on the vent valve lever. The choke unloader adjustment is next. To check the choke unloader, hold the throttle valves wide open. Then insert the proper size drill between the upper edge of the choke valve and inner wall of the air horn. With light pressure on the choke lever, the drill should have slight drag when removed. To adjust the unloader, bend the unloader tang on the fast idle cam. You'd better be sure that when opening the throttle valves to use enough pressure to overcome the secondary throttle lever spring. This spring is very stiff, and if the primary throttle valves aren't open completely, the choke unloader adjustment will be wrong. Thanks, Tech. The secondary part of the four-barrel carburetor should get just as much attention as the rest of the carburetor. The air valve in the secondary is operated strictly by airflow. It doesn't open until the velocity is great enough. Here's how it works. The spring tension on the air valve must be enough to hold it closed as the secondary throttle valves start to open. This creates a vacuum in the secondary air horn to start fuel flowing in the secondary nozzles before the airflow is sufficient to open the secondary air valve. Are there any adjustments on the secondary air valve? Only one, Tom. Pretty important, too. You can use the detailed procedure in this month's reference book to adjust the spring tension. If air valve spring tension isn't right, here's what happens. Too little tension allows the air valve to open too soon when the secondary throttle valves are open quickly. If the air valve opens too soon, you don't get that increase in vacuum to start fuel flow in the secondary nozzles. This can cause a hesitation, flat spot, or even backfire from a lean mixture. Too much tension will delay opening the air valve. As a result, the mixture will be too rich until the valve opens. This may affect both economy and performance. How about the secondary throttle operation, Don? There are two things which affect the operation of the secondary throttle valves, the secondary lockout and the secondary throttle linkage. We'll cover the lockout first. The purpose of the secondary lockout is to keep the secondaries closed during engine warm-up. The secondary lockout tang engages the secondary throttle shaft tang until the fast idle screw is completely off the fast idle cam. If the secondary throttle valves were able to open during warm-up, poor performance would be the result. To check the secondary lockout, crack the throttle valves partly open, then open and close the choke valve. The lockout tang should freely engage the tang on the secondary throttle shaft. If it doesn't, bend the secondary throttle shaft tang until engagement is made with the lockout tang. The secondary throttle linkage has a connecting rod that may require adjustment to obtain proper opening sequence between the primary and secondary throttle valves. The secondary throttle valves should start to open after the primaries have opened about 60 degrees. To make sure they're opening properly, invert the carburetor and make sure the lockout is disengaged. Open the throttle valve slowly until the secondaries just start to open. Check for correct opening by measuring between the lower edge of the primary throttle valve facing the secondaries and the bore. If it is necessary to adjust the secondary throttle opening, bend the secondary throttle connecting rod. This adjustment may affect the clearance between the positive closing shoes, so be sure and check it. To do this, 
close the primary throttle valves all the way. You should be able to insert a 20,000th gauge between the positive closing shoes. Clearance is adjusted by bending the shoe on the secondary throttle lever. Finally, make sure shoes do not interfere when throttle valves are open. Well, that takes care of the linkage, Tom. Now... I hate to interrupt, Don, but that takes care of this side of the record. Will someone please turn it? To check the step-up rods and pistons, remove the step-up piston cover plates very carefully. Hold the cover plate with your finger to keep the piston and rods from flying out. They're spring-loaded. Here's what happens if a piston sticks. If the piston gets stuck at the top of the cylinder, you'll have poor economy and high emissions before the secondaries are opened. When the piston is stuck at the bottom, you'll get a lean mixture and poor performance during acceleration. What causes the pistons to stick, Don? Same old problem, Tom, dirt. Clean the piston, spring, and metering rod thoroughly with carburetor solvent. And if necessary, polish the piston with crocus cloth. Don't use anything but crocus cloth. And be careful not to remove any metal around the lands on the piston. Go ahead, Don. Good point, Tech. The Carter AVS carburetor used on cars with air conditioning has a hot idle compensator valve on the secondary section between the bores. This valve leans out the rich mixtures which result from high underhood temperatures. Here's how it works. At normal temperatures, the compensator valve is held closed by a bimetallic spring. When underhood temperatures climb, the valve opens an air passage directly to the intake manifold to relieve an over-rich condition as a result of fuel vapors. And don't tinker with a compensator valve or you will upset the calibration. Anything else before we get to the holly? A few things, Tech. One of them is idle mixture and speed adjustments. They go hand in hand. The objective is to arrive at the correct idle speed, correct air-fuel ratio, and correct balance between the two idle systems for acceptable idle operation. The usual idle mixture and speed adjusting precautions apply. The engine must be warmed up, ignition timing correct, use an accurate tachometer, and connect an exhaust analyzer to check air-fuel ratio. I won't go into details on idle speed and mixture adjustment. Follow the service manual carefully and you won't have any problems. However, there are a couple of precautions I'd like to point out. Adjust both mixture screws one sixteenth at a time until the air-fuel ratio is within specifications. And remember, always adjust from rich to lean. The reference book will give you a detailed procedure. If everything else is okay, you've probably got an imbalance between the two primary bores. If you have one of these new carbs, you'll have to remove the plastic limiting tabs and reset the idle mixture screws. On early production carburetors, the two limiter screws at the base have to be unplugged and reset. The procedure for resetting either model is in the reference book. That wraps up the AVS four-barrel, Tom. Now let's take a close look at the Holley four-barrel carburetor. I think we can find some pretty important things to review. The vacuum kick unit may look slightly different, but works the same as the AVS kick unit. Any adjustments are also made at the loop in the vacuum kick link. The specs are not the same, so check your service manual when setting the vacuum kick. Two things are pretty important when setting the vacuum kick. First, make sure the modulating spring is fully compressed, and be careful not to twist the diaphragm when you change the link opening. It doesn't take much to twist the diaphragm, and be careful not to bend the bracket either. I just noticed that there isn't any fast idle speed adjusting screw on this holly. That's right, Tom. The fast idle adjusting tang does two jobs, sets the fast idle speed and affects the fast idle cam position. Let's do the fast idle speed adjustment first. Whoa, Don. Before we go any further, I think there's a point here that should be brought up and clarified. I'm sure you know that you have to qualify the choke control lever. Why don't you tell Tom how it's done, Don? All you want to do is make sure that the choke control lever hole is the proper distance above the carburetor base with the choke closed. Adjusting the loop at the upper end of the choke shaft rod gives you the correct measurement. And remember, the choke lever must be qualified before making vacuum kick, cam position, or choke unloader adjustments. To check fast idle speed, first make sure the engine is warmed up. Then position the fast idle tang on the second highest step of the fast idle cam and check engine speed. To adjust fast idle speed, insert a screwdriver in the fast idle tang slot. Turn to the right to increase and to the left to reduce fast idle speed. 
Hold the cam in position and flash the throttle. The engine should level out at proper RPM. And watch that adjustment. The tang affects both fast idle speed and cam position. So when you adjust the fast idle speed, always double check the fast idle cam position. Next, we have to adjust the fast idle cam position to assure proper speeds at each step of the fast idle cam during warm-up. To check cam position, place the fast idle tang on second highest speed step. Then, lift the choke control lever lightly to close the choke. Insert the specified drill or gauge in the choke valve opening. You should feel a slight drag when removing the drill. To adjust the fast idle cam position, bend the cam position adjusting tang until you have the correct choke valve opening. There is one other thing you should watch for when making the fast idle speed adjustment. Make sure the fast idle tang does not rub against the back of the cam. Let's go on to the choke unloader. To check the choke unloader adjustment, move the throttle valves wide open and hold the choke valve closed with light pressure on the choke control lever. Use the proper size drill listed in the service manual to check the amount the choke valve opens. To widen the choke opening, bend the choke unloader tang toward the pin on the fast idle cam. If you have to narrow the opening, bend the tang the other way. And don't forget, when you make these adjustments, always be sure that the drill is resting flush against the air horn wall. Otherwise, the adjustment can be off. It's your show again, Don. Okay, Tech. Now for the accelerator pump adjustment. It's quite a bit different from the AVS pump and is adjusted with the primary throttle valves wide open. So, hold the throttle valves wide open and move the pump diaphragm lever down as far as it'll go. Check the clearance between the diaphragm lever and the adjusting screw. To adjust the clearance, turn the screw in or out. When the pump is set, the bowl vent valve is the next adjustment. On this carburetor, you check the valve opening when the primary throttle is at curb idle position. Bend the curved part of the operating rod to adjust the valve. And watch when making the adjustment to be sure the transfer tube doesn't interfere with a bowl vent rod. Hey, Don, what are the two holes in the throttle bell crank for? They position the accelerator pump cam. The cam screw should be in the upper or number one hole when you adjust pump lever clearance for normal operating conditions. Use the second hole for high temperature operation. And that brings us to the secondary section. This diaphragm unit opens the secondary throttle valves when air flow through the venturis creates enough vacuum to overcome the diaphragm spring. No adjustment is needed here, but if the diaphragm is replaced for any reason, make sure the replacement spring color is the same as the original. This late production Holley carburetor has an idle mixture adjusting screw in each side of the primary metering block. You'll have to check the service manual for the specs, but the procedures and precautions are generally the same as for the AVS model. If you have to reset the idle mixture screws for proper balance, remove the plastic stop tabs. I'm sure most of you know, but if you have to reset the limiter screws on an early production holly, they're under the plugs on each side of the primary metering block. On the early production models, the idle mixture adjusting screw is in the air horn. This means you'll have to adjust the idle mixture with the air cleaner removed and then recheck the idle mixture and speed after installing the air cleaner. Care to add anything, Don? One thing, Tech. If you remove the choke control lever or the accelerator pump lever, be sure to crimp the spring retainer clip when you put it back on. If it spreads, it can fall off. That about wraps it up, Tech. Before we go, if you technicians have made all the external adjustments and you still have problems, there's a few things you'd better check. Make sure that both the primary and secondary fuel bowl screws are properly tightened. Incidentally, when installing the fuel bowl screws, make sure you use the new screw seals included in the kit. The screw seal should be installed on the screws. If you put them in the bowl cavity and thread the screws through them, you'll get bits of the seal in the fuel bowl, which may cause future problems. If you run across a carburetor with an obsolete power valve, replace it with a new type. Always use a new gasket and tighten the valve to the correct torque. You'll find the torque rating in the reference book. Another thing you want to watch out for is the primary metering body gasket. Make sure it's the right one. The location of the passage holes is different. And if you use the 68 gasket on a 67 model, the projection prevents sealing. 
It's also very important to tighten the secondary metering block screws and throttle body screws to the correct torque. Check the reference book for this one, too. Float level specifications were revised after the service manual went to press. So be sure and check your service bulletins for the latest float level information. And on the subject of float level, if you have a wet gauge, be sure and use it to check float level after the carburetor is all buttoned up and installed on the car. And before we button this session up, I want to point out that this month's reference book has a lot of additional, up-to-the-minute information on Holly 4 barrels that should come in mighty handy. See you all at our next meeting.